We'll go ahead and open your Bibles with me, if you will, to, to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, and as you do, last week we began to look at Paul's uh, ministry in the city of Corinth. I told you then that uh, it was going to be a part two uh, message necessary, and so here's where we find ourselves today in part two of this message. But we're looking at Paul's ministry in the city of Corinth, the same city that will receive two of the letters that we have by their name there in the New Testament, First and Second Corinthians. Corinth itself being a city of approximately 200,000 people. It's a bustling, it was a bustling uh, city. Um, and economically, commercially, um, politically, um, very much a port city um, that was inundated with sexual debauchery, rampant immorality, all of that there. Um, so a, a very, very secular culture uh, there in Corinth. But it was, it was also a city that had a very well-established synagogue, which is where Paul, if we've been <laughs> following along with Paul's ministry at all throughout our journey through uh, the book of Acts, especially the last several chapters, um, we've seen that there was a synagogue if a city had a synagogue, that's where Paul went first. He went there to engage the Jews and God-fearing Gentiles with the Scriptures, to engage them, to reason with them, in order to attempt to persuade them that Jesus is the Christ. That was his goal. But now, <laughs> when thinking about how Paul had been treated in the synagogues thus far, especially by the religious leaders of the synagogues, in each of these prior uh, cities along his journey, um, even on his first journey, let's just say that it wasn't well, was it? He wasn't received with great hospitality and great welcoming. No, rather he was stoned. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was mocked, threatened. Yeah, the list could go on. He was not well received. And now here he enters into Corinth. Self-admittedly, as he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we looked at this in depth last week, but he enters into this city weak, fearful, trembling. Paul's own words. And he's all alone. Because remember, Timothy and Titus, Timothy and Silas haven't reunited with him since he was ushered out of Berea um, and on his way to Athens. He's been alone, both in Athens and now on his way to Corinth. And so all this to say, Paul enters into the city of Corinth, a, a very dark city, a very difficult city in its own right, not in a good place. Not in a good place, mentally speaking. He, he, he's likely for him, he's at an all-time low. And while I know we can be tempted to think of Paul as some su superhuman apostle dude, uh, he was very much human in every way. And he's very discouraged. And yet, he's still trying his best in the midst of his discouragement to be faithful which may describe where you find yourself today. Feeling weak, feeling fearful, discouraged. All of this as it applies specifically to wanting to, but feeling weak, fearful, and discouraged as it applies to engaging the culture with the gospel. You're still trying to be faithful, but this is where you find yourself. And if this is you, then I think that this message is certainly for you this morning. So let's read once again Acts chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. 
When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go on to the, go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. When Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So Paul enters into Corinth. He goes to the synagogue to reason from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And how is he received when he goes to the synagogue? Verse 6, they opposed and reviled him. And at this very point, this is where Paul can already see the writing on the wall in this situation. He knows how this story goes. He's lived it before. And it's like, I've had enough. Enough is enough. And he, so he shakes out his garments, which is a visible sign of like, I'm done with you. <laughs> he's frustrated. He's upset. And he tells them, them being the Jews, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And see what this is. is Paul's weakness. It's Paul's fear. And his trembling. Leading to his self-justifying and disobedient response. You ever been there? Have you ever been there where experienced a time of, of weakness, experiencing a time of fear, trembling, discouragement, and maybe you make a, a rapid like response decision that, that isn't rooted in faith, is not rooted in truth. It's just a response, a reactionary response to, to fear. If we're being honest, all of us have to one degree or another. That's Paul in this moment. He's tired of the rejection, tired of the beatings, tired of the mocking. Again, he's all alone. His weakened flesh is on full display, and he leaves the synagogue in frustration, goes directly next, next door to the house of a Gentile god fear, and clearly continues to preach Christ. So he's trying to be faithful, still wanting to be faithful. And even though he's walking in fear, all of this is compounding. I want to be faithful, but I'm walking in fear. I'm making these decisions. And this is when the Lord comes to Paul one night in a vision. And he tells him there in verse 9, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And then we're told, Paul, look at this. He stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now, last week, as we studied these verses, 
our focus was threefold. Looking at how the Lord encouraged and challenged Paul by saying, do not be afraid, do not be silent, for I am with you. And our primary focus last week was on on how God, whenever he calls his people to do big, daunting, fear-inducing tasks, like all throughout Scripture, when he calls them to do these big things, he tells them, telling us, do not be afraid, do not be silent, for I am with you. We've seen it with Moses, seen it with Joshua, seen it with Jeremiah, see it with the Great Commission. We see it all throughout Scripture. And how is it that God is with us? We looked at this again last week as well. I mean, first and foremost, how is God with us? It's like an open book test. If you turn back to Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, like the answer is there. Like since Pentecost, he is with us first and foremost through the power that we have been given through the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who indwelled Paul, now indwelling everyone who believes. Such a great and needed reminder in our times of weakness, in our times of fear, in our times of trembling. We have the Spirit within us, boasting in our weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon us. Knowing that through the power of the Spirit, when we are weak in the flesh, (laughs) we are strong in Christ. Such great comfort from these truths. But what I want to do today is, is look at some other ways that God is working in and around Paul's circumstances to show the power of Christ working in his weaknesses, yes, but to also visibly and tangibly tangibly remind him, I'm with you. I'm with you. Because while the Spirit is enough, let's make no question about this, the Spirit is enough. The Lord knows how weak we really are. (laughs) He knows how weak we really are and how fearful we really can be. And he provides some great I'm with you encouragements in our everyday, day-to-day lives that we might not see, let's just say, through the darkness of our fear. It's like these encouragements all around, everywhere, and we've got this darkness, these scales that are blinding our eyes to be able to see them. But before going through these, I want to issue a quick disclaimer. That that disclaimer being that while many of these things are or can also be true in our lives, they're not universal promises, at least not in how we might be tempted to think. So we'll explain that further, but just consider God's promise of protection. God's promise of protection. Notice how in verse 10, after the Lord says, for I am with you, he follows this by saying, and no one will attack you to harm you. Now, is this what Paul had experienced to this point? (laughs) A freedom from attack? No, not at all. The attacks he's experienced are, are part of the reason why he's experiencing so much fear. That's why he's in this spot. And with this, if you're familiar with Paul's ministry like after this, so you've read ahead, you're familiar with com- what comes through the rest of Acts and Paul's ministry. If you're familiar with this, will this promise of protection be true of Paul's ministry universally going forward? Will he be free from all freedom from future attacks? No. <laughs> we'll see him face much greater suffering, won't we? But this promise of protection is true of his remaining time in Corinth. We do see that. And I want us to look at how this plays out. But as we do, I also want to make clear that this this specific promise of protection is made to Paul. It is a promise that is made specifically to Paul. It's not something that we can read and then immediately apply to ourselves in the exact same way. There's a word for that. That's called eisegesis. What that is, is that's reading something into the Scriptures that the Scriptures were never meant to say. 
and then applying them to ourselves in ways that they were never meant to be applied. Something we can all be tempted to do, something we probably all have done at one time or another. But Scripture can never mean what Scripture never meant. It's really important to understand as we study the Scriptures and look to apply them. Scripture can never mean what Scripture never meant, which is why context is always key. But look with me quickly at the circumstances playing out in verses 12 through 16. And now in verse 12, we're told that the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. So he's already had the vision. He's already received the promise of protection from the Lord. And however long later, but still while in Corinth, here comes a united attack against Paul. So think about this from Paul's perspective for a moment. He's entered the city (laughs) feeling weak. He's entered the city feeling fearful and trembling. He receives this promise of protection from the Lord, and then here comes an attack against him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the thoughts that must have been running through his mind in this moment? Has to be wondering if God is actually with him. Has to be wondering if God's promise is true. Thinking, okay, here we go again. And then what happens? The Corinthian Roman proconsul tells his Jewish accusers, I have no reason to accept your complaints. Uh, They're coming looking for blood. And he's like, can't do anything for you. Meaning he refused to judge Paul on the charges that have been brought against Paul. And just lets him go free, (laughs) unharmed. And what? Protected. And the Jews who brought the charges, they get so upset, they turn their anger towards their own synagogue ruler. Did you catch that? <laughs> like they get so upset that they turn their anger towards their own synagogue ruler who likely took the place of Crispus, who we'll look at in just a moment again, and beat him instead of Paul. <laughs> All of this meaning what? God's promise is true. God has placed a hedge of protection around Paul in Corinth as he remains for another year and a half teaching the gospel under the Lord's instruction and the Lord's protection. Now, again, does this mean that we are guaranteed the same promise of protection? No. Not in the exact same way it doesn't. Physically, we may suffer. And we may suffer greatly as we look to faithfully follow Christ and to live faithfully in this fallen world. Anyone who who preaches anything counter to this or teaches anything counter to this, let's just be honest, they are not preaching what is true from the Bible. But here's the promise of protection we cling to as Christians. We do have a promise of protection. If we are in Christ, here's the promise. We will not be destroyed. We will not be destroyed. For to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. God with us now, God with us then, God with us forever because of the finished work of Christ. Because Christ rose from the dead, so will we who are trusting in Christ as our only hope in life and in death. This is the protection that we are promised. This is the protection that is guaranteed. This is the protection that awaits all followers of Christ. Even if the worst is to come, We are protected in Christ forever. And friends, there is no greater protection than this. This is one way we see God with us. The promise in the already but the not yet that we who are in Christ are secure in Christ forever, even if the worst is to come through our faithfulness. Another way, another one is God's promise to build his church. Now, of course, not everyone, in fact, most everyone, will not see the amount of fruit Paul witnessed. It would be nice, but we'll not see all the fruit that Paul witnessed. We won't see the kind of success that he experienced. 
which is a helpful and needed reminder in and of itself, in, in that if Paul can experience weakness, and Paul can experience fear, and Paul, super apostle dude Paul, can experience trembling, if Paul can face this discouragement, all while experiencing the fruitful ministry that he did, So really discouraged, really fearful, and all kinds of fruit that is there. If he can experience those things, it's the reminder that ministerial success will never be enough to wipe away our weaknesses and fear and trembling and discouragement. Christ himself must be enough. Christ must be enough. As I thought about this, I was drawn to think about the the prophet Isaiah. Told at the very beginning of his prophetic ministry. I mean, you couldn't have a prophetic ministry start off with more dramatic of a calling, in a sense. Like, he gets a vision of the throne room of God in Isaiah chapter 6. Seraphim, these angelic beings circling in the throne room of God with two wings they cover their face, two wings they cover their feet, and with two wings they fly. (laughs) And they're crying out, singing over and over again, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's what they do. That's what they're doing. They're just circling the throne room of God. (laughs) And he hears this, and all of it's taking place, and he hears the Lord say, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah responds, how? Here I am, like, send me. And I'm like, he's ready. Like, it's like altar call for Isaiah. Like, he's ready to go. I'm all in. Like, send me to the nations. Lord, let's do this. And then the Lord tells him, here's the message you're to give. And ultimately, the Lord tells him, no one's going to ever believe. They're not going to respond in faith. You are to preach, and you are to keep preaching, and no one will believe you. Meaning Isaiah's entire ministry would result in no believers. Just a message of judgment. Ugh. I'm guessing not exactly what he had in mind in that moment. He might have had that moment of like, uh, can I bring my hand down now? I don't know. He was obviously faithful. But what a, like just no one's going to respond in faith. But I highlight this because we're not in charge of the fruit. We're, We're not in charge of the results. We plant, we water, and it's God who gives the growth. But we, we know based upon the Lord's promises that the Lord will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This will happen. He will build his church. It is happening now. It is happening. We're seeing the the start of it in Acts, and we are a part of it going forward. It is happening. But yeah, find yourself in a spot like Paul, constantly getting mocked, Constantly being attacked by the Jewish religious, religious leaders of, of all people. And yeah, he in his flesh is like, I'm, I'm done with you. But what's the Lord tell Paul in the second part of verse 10? After he's told him, do not be afraid. Do not be silent. For I am with you. He tells him, I have many in this city who are my people. I have many in this city who are my people. To which I can see Paul thinking, like, where? Like, like where? Have you seen this city? Like, do you see what's taking place? Looking around the city and all, and be like, I just don't see it, Lord. I don't, I don't see it. And yes, there are, there are a few already. But compared to the vastness of the city, to say, there are, there are many in this city who are my people. Paul's like, I don't see it. To which I can equally imagine the Lord being like, ah, but you will. But you will. And church, this pastor here 
needed to be reminded of that this week. As these words from the Lord, where he says, I have many in this city who are my people, it is a powerful declaration, a powerful reference of the Lord's definite atoning and saving work. The Lord here referring to those in Corinth who have never even heard the gospel, never believed the gospel yet, but will. Referring to those who are his. That's who he's referring to. See, this is a reference to those whom the Lord chose in himself before the foundation of the world was ever laid. Paul doesn't see it. All he sees is lostness everywhere, debauchery everywhere. But the Lord sees those whom Christ came to claim as his. Those who are about to hear and believe over this year and a half period of time. Those who are in, at this moment or walking and living in the domain of darkness but are about to be, but are about to be as a result of God's amazing grace, are about to be transferred to the kingdom of God's beloved Son and receive redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Oh, what glorious news. Friends, this was true of all of us at one time as well. This is true of how we may be tempted to look at the world around us, seeing the task so hard, such vileness was out there, ready to give up. It's just too dark, the unbelief too great, while God looks upon the nations and he sees and knows those who are his, those who are waiting to hear the gospel and maybe waiting to hear it for the hundredth time or for the very first time. But either way, at God's appointed time, they hear, and by the Spirit's power, they believe. Because somebody shared the good news. And the Lord is telling Paul, I know this can be scary. I know this is hard. But I'm about to do the impossible through you. So do not be afraid. Do not be silent for I'm with you. You need evidence, Paul? You need some evidence? Look at what I've already done. Look at Aquila and Priscilla. Oh, and remember how Paul in his fear and his weakness was like, I'm done with the Jews. I'm, I'm going next door, I'm done. And then he went next door, didn't he? To the home of a Gentile believer, right? I'm, I'm, I'm ministering to the Gentiles now. Yeah, about that. Who was the first person we're told who believes? Verse 9. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. His entire Jewish household like synagogue, like Crispus, leader of the Jewish synagogue, and then also many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. So get this. Paul, in his fear and in his frustration, refuses to minister to the Jews anymore. He's like, I'm done. And the first person who comes to faith after this is the leader of the synagogue in his household. How awesome is that? Like how much, like that's just God doing this. Like, like I'm going to show you. Like there it is. And how powerful of a lesson is that to Paul and to us about what God can do in our weakest and most fearful moments. All of this followed by the reminder, do not be afraid. Do not be silent for I am with you. I have many in this city who are my people both Jews and Gentiles. So let's get to work. And this is when we're told Paul remains in Corinth for a year and a half teaching the word of God among them. Paul engaging the culture, engaging people where they were at with the gospel and seeing God's church come forth one repenting sinner at a time. 
a beautiful picture of, of God's sovereignty over salvation, coupled with the undeniable human responsibility that he has given. His faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. It's a reminder that God will build his church. It will happen. It is happening. But he does it through the preaching and teaching and sharing and the proclaiming of his word. Meaning if, if we don't see the fruit that we'd like to see, don't be afraid. Don't be silent. For he is with us. Now in the broader text, we also see how God provided Paul encouragement through God's gift of friendship. A gift that may look different in different seasons of life, may not always look like we desire it to look, may not work out for us exactly the way we see it for Paul, but it's also the reminder of God's gift of the local church. If we're in Christ and connected with the church, friends, we're never in this life alone. We are never alone. See, at the very beginning of chapter 18, we're introduced to Aquila and Priscilla, a Jewish couple who, who face their own adversities in life. And we may look at some of those in the coming weeks, but they befriend Paul when he comes to Corinth. And at some point, they come to faith in Christ. Could have been before they met Paul, could have been after. I tend to believe it was after they met Paul. But either way, they've come to faith in Christ and they become a great encouragement to Paul in the final chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Rome where he refers to them as his fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Even saying that they risked their necks for him, no doubt referring to his time there in Corinth where they gave him a job. They gave him a place to stay. They took him in and embraced him as a friend, helped provide him protection even though it could have cost them absolutely everything. And as we'll see in the coming weeks, they go on to help him not only in the church there in Corinth, but with the church in Ephesus and the church in Rome. What a gift. But then there were Silas and Timothy. Remember, he's been dropped off in Athens all alone. With Silas and Timothy left behind in Berea, which means that this is the first time in Paul's ministry that he's been alone processing all that he's facing alone. That's hard. But when, he, when they finally meet up with him in Corinth, they bring three things of great encouragement to Paul. You can kind of jot these down. They won't be on the screen. But one, they bring their presence. They bring their presence, which is in and of itself a, a, a gift of great encouragement from the Lord. <laughs> Paul loves them both, especially grows to, to love Timothy as a son. Two, they bring good news about the church in Thessalonica. We learn of this in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, of how grateful he was for their, their faith and love and how they were standing firm in the faith, something that greatly encouraged his soul. Because let's remember, like when he left Thessalonica, he didn't know if the church was going to make it. He didn't know what was going to become of the church. And here they come telling him that his work has not been in vain, that there is fruit that is taking place. The church is growing. That young church is beginning to thrive. And then three, they brought with them a missionary offering from the church in Philippi. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, and Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, where he concludes his letter by thanking him, them, the church in Philippi. He says, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you, Philippians, yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only meaning the church that didn't exist a short time ago. Like, remember the context of the church in Philippi. It did not exist a short time ago. A church made up of Lydia's household, a formerly demonic, demonly possessed girl, and the Philippian jailer's household, and now clearly others are now making it possible financially for Paul to carry on the mission 
of those who have yet to hear the gospel. We'll look at more of this in the coming weeks as well, but notice how Paul's ministry isn't solo. It's connected to the local church. The church in Antioch sends him out financially and prayerfully, making it possible for him and the others to go. But now the church in Philippi is stepping in to help as well. A reminder, we can do more together than we can do on our own. This is one of the reasons why we, we sacrificially give as, as a church and partner with other churches so we can help others go, continue to work both locally and globally. Number four, God's gift of financial provision. See, when Paul arrived in Athens, his only source of, of income was what he had in his possession. Whatever he had left from the church of Antioch, that was it. And it likely wasn't much considering all that he had already been through to this point. But he meets Aquila and Priscilla because he was looking for a job. I mean, that's how they meet. He's looking for a job. Nowhere are we told that he meets them because they were believers, but because he needed a job. Verse 3 telling us he was of the same trade. Paul was a tent maker. And so he stayed with them and he worked which leads me to believe that he was the one who shared the gospel with him. That he was the one where while he worked, while he was employed, he shared the gospel with Aquila and Priscilla, maybe over some evening meals, maybe as they worked on the tents, but he was the one who the Lord used to bring them to saving faith in Christ. But in, the, in this, the Lord provided for his needs by giving him a job. Can't overlook that what a gift that is of the Lord. He was a bivocational pastor in this moment working throughout the week, sharing the gospel as he had opportunity, reasoning and explaining the gospel through relationships that he made in the workplace. And then he went to the synagogue and he reasoned and explained from the scriptures over the weekend. That's hard work, tiring work. One of the benefits of Paul's singleness in this moment. And this is the Lord's provision until Silas and Timothy arrived and with an offering from Philippi that allowed him to become a full-time missionary and minister of the gospel once again, easing his financial burden, allowing even more time to be devoted to gospel work, but all as the result of the Lord's provision through the local church. The church in Philippi sacrificially giving so Paul and Silas and Timothy could continue in full -time, the full-time work of ministry. But at the same time, don't forget Aquila and Priscilla. They remained a, a full-time tent makers and used their occupation to help start and strengthen churches in Corinth and in Ephesus and eventually in Rome. And we're going to, again, look at this further in the coming weeks. But ju just as our missionary friends shared last week, how there is a large need of people to leverage their everyday occupations for the cause of Christ all over the world. There are, there are teachers and engineers and accountants and medical workers needed all over the world. Needed here as well, yes. Don't just need Christian teachers, but Christians who are teachers. Not just Christian musicians, but musicians who are Christians, not just Christian accountants, but accountants who are Christians and are using their God-given gifts and their God-given positions to intentionally engage the world with the gospel, whether it's locally or globally. But with all of this, do you see how God is with us, giving us the Spirit, protecting us through the finished work of Christ, building his church through the continued proclamation of the gospel, what the world would think is weak and foolish. He's building his church. He gives us friendships by giving us the local church, and he uses the local church to provide the means to accomplish the mission that he's called us to. Do you see all of this? Be encouraged, church. Be challenged, church. Don't be afraid. Don't be silent, for he is with us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. 
and that you are with us. And that you are with us first and foremost through your Son, Jesus, and the Spirit that you sent to be our helper. Just the name, Emmanuel, God with us. Or the whole plan of redemption and restoration is a whole means of, of you bringing your people into your presence for your glory. And Lord, we admit there's so much that we're afraid of. There's so much that seeks to silence our witness. But Lord, where we are weak, help us to remember that we are strong in Christ. Lord, when we are tempted to be silent, help us to remember that we have the one message that can actually bring hope and life to a lost and broken world. And Lord, when we feel that we cannot do this at all in our own strength, help us to realize that's true and to press in and rely upon you even more and to remember you are with us. Lord, help us to plant, help us to water, And Lord, help us to trust you to give the growth. We ask in Jesus' name.